I have nothing. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in again. I, I, we're really happy to see you. Um, as a quick reminder, um, we have one more scheduled set of talks for next week. Um, and then we probably will take a little bit of a break. Uh, uh, I might be getting in touch with a couple of the, the LRD people and just kind of get their advice on what they think about going forward. Um, but so uh, we'll see you next week and then um, we'll be back in touch with what our plan is going forward. Um, with that, I'll hand over now to uh, Dr. Eric Ortland, who will introduce our first speaker. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is a really a treat for me to be able to introduce Denise. Denise was my first postdoc who's gone on to become an assistant professor at a, an R1 institution. So, um, so I'm really proud of her. Um, and I'll just keep this intro brief. So Denise earned uh, a BS in biomedical chemistry at Oral Roberts University. She then went on to Georgia Tech, earning a master's degree in computational chemistry, followed by a PhD in biochemistry. Um, during her training, she focused on using computational tools to understand protein, DNA, RNA folding. Um, and I think centered more around protein design. We recruited her to Emory as part of the NIH ERACTA program uh, in 2015. She joined my lab um, and we set about um, setting up molecular dynamics in the lab to look at uh, how nuclear receptors um, you know, are activated through Alice area. And so she brought in lots of interesting uh, techniques uh, for us to, to look at this process. And so Denise has been remarkably successful. She contributed to five papers in my lab as middle author, published three papers as first author, uh, one of which we'll talk about today. Denise earned uh, numerous awards. I'll just name a couple. She was awarded the Burroughs Welcome um, Funds for uh, you know, career awards at the scientific interface. Um, so that's a really nice uh, award that, that helped, uh, you know, she was able to leverage, um, you know, I think in her current position. She was awarded a Ford Foundation Fellowship, um, which is also fairly prestigious and, uh, and numerous others. And so, uh, you know, Denise has been remarkably successful um, bringing a new technique to my lab um, and I'm really, uh, yeah, really proud of, uh, you know, seeing her blossom. So with that, Denise. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, and thank you all. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm excited to talk about this work, um, uh, talking about um, hormone specificity in an ancestral steroid receptor. So let's see. Okay. All right. So I'm showing you here a panel of steroid hormones. They're all cholesterol derived. So they all share that same scaffold. And the question that I've been wanting to ask, or I was wanting to ask here, is how are steroid receptors able to distinguish between hormones? Because what we see here is that there's a lot of similarity in these hormones, but they don't all bind and activate all receptors, right? The receptors are able to, to recognize which ones are, or distinguish between them so that they are specifically turned off or turned on by, by their binding. And so, so how have these receptors evolved mechanisms that allow them to, to distinguish between hormones that activate them and ones that don't? So that's, a, that's a, um, the, the topic of this um, paper and, and this work today. So in vertebrates, we know that there are five, or these are some, five of the classes of steroid hormone receptors that these have. Um, I've listed them here. And we know a lot about these receptors because they've been highly studied. So one of the things that we know is that they're highly structurally conserved. So I'm showing you an alignment of human steroid receptors, and you can see that they're basically indistinguishable. They all look exactly the same. But the other things that we know about them, again, because their evolution and their history have been studied, is we know the phylogeny of these receptors. So we know that the receptors, all, all the steroid receptors descend from a common ancestor. And let's me make this a mouse or a laser pointer. Great. Okay, we know that they all descend from a common ancestor, but we also know that there are really two classes of steroid hormone receptors, and I've tried to color them accordingly, right? So we have the estrogen receptors, and then we have everything else. Um, and so uh, a way that we can simplify this further is we can say we have the estrogen receptors and then the others all fall into this category called the three keto steroid receptors. And they're named that um, because of the hormones that activate them, right? So estrogen receptors are activated by these estrogen hormones and what they have in common is that they have an aromatized A ring and at, the, at this three position here, there's a hydroxyl group. Compare that to the three keto um, hormones that are, have an A ring that is not aromatized and have a three keto group, a keto group at that three position. So 
all of these three ketosteroid receptors, what they have in common is that they're activated by these kinds of hormones. So for the purposes of this study, um, again, drawing from this ancestral work that has been just um, a lot of work and a lot of elegant work done on the ancestry of the steroid receptor family, I've picked an ancestral steroid receptor called SR2. And just to explain what SR2 is, um, it's ANTSR2, I'll call it SR2 for short. To explain what SR2 is, imagine that if we um, took all the sequences of all of the three ketosteroid receptors that exist and tried to infer what would be their what would be the ancestor, what would be the sequence of the ancestor of all of these three ketosteroid receptors, what you would get is um, ANTSR2. And so this is the receptor I've used for this study. Um, uh, Again, a lot of work has been done to characterize SR2. So one of the things that was done was to try and understand hormone selectivity in SR2. So um, uh, again, a large um, group of ligands were tested for their ability to activate SR2 in transcriptional assays. These were um, done using luciferase recorder assays. So what you're seeing on the right here is on the, on the vertical axis, this is the EC50, which is uh, derived from the luciferase assays, so um, of the ability of these hormones to activate SR2. And you have um, on the horizontal, just all of the steroids that were used. And, and what you see is that pretty much corticosteroids, progestogens and androgens, all able to activate SR2. The only class of hormones that can activate SR2 are the estrogens. So in summary, we see that three ketosteroids are able to activate SR2 and um, aromatized hormones do not activate SR2. So the point of this um, work was to understand how does the SR2 ligand binding pocket distinguish between those hormones that activate, activate it and the ones that don't. And I'll say that uh, for the paper that I'm talking about today, I actually studied two different ancestral steroid receptors, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm focusing on just the one, which is SR2. Um, okay, so I'm a computational um, uh, biochemist, so I um, uh, ran uh, molecular dynamic simulations to try and understand this, approach this problem from this perspective of understanding how are conformational dynamics altered in these different uh, hormone ligand complexes. So I, I, I took this set of ligands, uh, hormones that you can see here on the left, and I generated um, SR2 complexes with all of these ligands. So there's 23 total. And so for each one, I ran 500 nanosecond molecular dynamics trajectories in triplicate. And I averaged out those trajectories for my analysis. And then in addition, I ran uh, trajectories for an unliganded SR2. So that means I had no ligand, right? So it's just APO. And I ran those. And those were done for kind of as a control and for comparison. And you'll see why I think those were really important to do. All right, so a couple of the analyses that I did. Um, the first one I'll talk about is a contact analysis where the goal was to ask what residues are forming a contact throughout the simulation. So what a contact analysis does is it, uh, for every protein complex, first of all, identifies what are, identifies the residue positions um, on that complex. So imagine on the left, we have our SR2 complex and imagine that all of these spheres are all identifying individual amino acid residues on that on that protein and then 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 the next thing is that we ask for every pair of residues in that complex nearest neighbors excluded um, do those residues um, stay within four and a half angstroms of each other for 75 percent of the simulation if they meet that criteria then we say there is a contact and we can draw a contact between them so that's what you're looking at here is a visual representation of what this contact map would look like based on this simulation and then based on the contact map we can then ask how are the different hormones altering this map for sr2 and so the way that i do this analysis is i first of all generate a contact map for um, the SR2 hormone complex. And then, like I said before, I also ran an APO um, simulation with no ligand, so I also generate a contact map for that APO um, receptor. And then I subtract the two and I end up with the difference contact map. The reason that I do this is because if there are contacts that are present in the APO receptor, then those are not necessarily interesting for the purposes of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to understand how ligands modify SR2. So 
if I want ligand specific effects, I should remove the things that are there even in the absence of ligand. So that's why I use these different contact maps. Okay, so this is the method that I used. And then I, uh, so I'll show you about, I'll show you, I guess, the contact that I, I found that I think was probably the most crucial one. So I um, wrote a script that parsed through all the contacts of all of my complexes that I had. I had 23 complexes and, 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 and it identified this contact right here. So there's a methionine 75 on this helix called helix 5 and leucine 42 on helix 3. And I'm showing you this contact on the left, but on the right I'm showing you all the atoms so you can see what it really looks like. But this contact was interesting for a couple of reasons. One, it's right in the ligand binding pocket so you can see the hormone uh, right there, right beneath those two residues. So that seemed interesting. But the other thing that it was that was interesting about it was this contact was discriminatory. So what I found was that this contact was present in all of the contact maps for my three ketosteroid hormone complexes, and it wasn't present in any of my estrogen complexes, right? So it seemed that this contact was somehow able to distinguish between the kind of ligand that's in the pocket, which is what distinguishes them functionally, right? There's aromatized um, versus three ketosteroids. And so I wanted to explore that further. And uh, I started by looking at this methionine, I guess that was what I was gonna um, kind of zoom in on that and see what was happening with that. So the nice thing about running simulations is that you can actually look at the trajectories and see what's happening. So I'm gonna show you here two, um, kind of two samples um, of, from my trajectories. And um, on the left is an, as the estradiol complex with SR2. Estradiol is an estrogen, does not activate SR2. And on the right is a, is a, a sampling from the DHT complex, which does activate SR2. Um, and I want you to pay attention to this methionine that you can see sitting right above the A-ring of the hormone. Let's see. Okay, so just pay attention to the methionine and what's happening with that, and I, I can I'll go over it um, shortly, and then compare that with the DHT comp with the DHT simulation and the methionine, and and hopefully what you see right away is that on the left in the estradiol complex, the methionine is flipping back and forth, right? It's either kind of pointing up or it's pointing down at the hormone compared to the DHT complex where it's maintaining a pretty steady interaction with the leucine on helix three, not really ever coming down to interact with the hormone. So it seemed that there's something about the estradiol that is causing that methionine to flip, right? that's not happening with DHT. So to explore that further, I looked through my simulations and I'm measuring here, the distance between the sulfur on the methionine and the center of mass of the A-ring of the hormone. And so I do that, and here on the left, I'm showing you on the y-axis is that distance, and on the horizontal axis, this is just my simulation. So we're, we're following that distance across the simulation. And so what you see on the top, this is DHT, three ketosteroid. You see that except for a couple of places where, there, where it kind of, um, you know, I guess there's a flipping out. For the most part, there's a pretty steady interaction of about four and a half angstroms. Um, there's pretty steady distance, uh, our distance for that distance between the, the sulfur and the A-ring. Compare that with the estradiol complex, you kind of see two, you see a clear biconformational behavior where the distance is either here around four and a half or somewhere up here at about five and a half angstroms. So I've drawn these lines to show you where those two distances seem to be. And I went ahead and I looked through some of my other um, steroids that I've that I'd modeled, and you see that there's a pretty consistent trend where uh, three keto steroids, again, pretty stable interaction throughout the simulation. And with the estrogens, you see this kind of up and down behavior is not a steady interaction. And so what it seems is happening is that in the in the um, uh, the three keto steroids. Well, okay, it's steady in the three ketosteroids, but with the estrogens, right, that's where it's interesting. It seems like they're, it's just not able to maintain, methionine's not able to maintain a steady interaction with the A-ring. And, and so kind of going to look at that, what's happening in the structure of that, the summary of what's happening is that with the three ketosteroids, um, what you have is the methionine pointing up because it's making that contact with the leucine, and this is the contact that was present in my contact map. Um, but in the estrogens, the reason that that contact's not present is because methionine isn't making a steady interaction with leucine. 
In some cases, it's making that interaction, but in the other cases, it's actually trying to interact with the earring of the hormone. And uh, what we hypothesized is going on is that we know that uh, amino acids that have sulfurs have been shown to be able to form these sulfur high interactions with aromatic groups. And so we hypothesize that this might be what's going on. Um, this frustration, I guess is what we call it with the methionine that it's experiencing, could be the result of the presence of an aromatic group on the airing of the estrogen. It's not there in the three ketosteroids, but that aromatic group is causing the methionine to be frustrated and almost kind of wanting to um, interact with the A ring, but then uh, also drawn to the leucine, and so there's an unstable um, interaction that's happening there. All right, so I'll talk about one more analysis that I did, which is um, using enhanced conformational sampling to really explore conformational distributions in SR2 and ask how are these hormones changing those distributions. And so I, for this subset, um, I already picked a subset of the hormones of the larger set that I started out with. So I have these um, four on top. These are all three ketosteroids, so we know that they activate SR2, and I have one estrogen, which is estradiol on the bottom doesn't activate SR2. Now, I won't go into the details of the method, but it's called accelerated molecular dynamics. And what it does is that it lowers potential energy barriers and allows us to enhance conformational sampling compared to classical molecular dynamics. And so, and, and I did, again, I did this because I wanted to get just kind of a broader picture of sampling in these, in these complexes. And so I ran these simulations and then after the simulations, I performed some clustering and um, the goal with the clustering analysis was to ask how are these ligands altering conformational distributions in SR2. So the idea is that um, I have ligand bound SR2 and I have APO SR2 and I can ask how similar are these structures from these two different types of um, simulations. And so I, if, you, if we can visualize these clusters two possibilities in general is our clusters would look something like this on the left or they would look something like this on the right. Where imagine that the light blue um, uh, structures are derived from uh, APO SR2 simulations and the, the dark blue ones are derived from ligand bound SR2 simulations. If we have a scenario on the left, we could, we could generate a histogram for these four clusters that look something like this. And what this would imply is that there is significant conformational overlap between the ligand bound and APO, which means that the addition of ligand to SR2 is not changing the structure of SR2 significantly enough. And so an RMSD-based clustering algorithm is not, does not detect the difference between the two types of structures. And so there's just large conformational overlap, no significant change in receptor conformations. But if we have the scenario on the right in our clustering, where we have these clusters that are pretty much entirely all apple or ligand bound, and there's no overlap between the two, this would imply that the addition of the ligand is significantly altering the receptor. And so again, RMSD-based clustering is not is separating them because they're so different. So these are the options that I knew would be um, the things that I knew would be possibilities are the two options that I was expecting to see one or the other. So I'll show you the results, starting with aldosterone. Aldosterone is a three ketosteroid. You see that these are colored orange if they're um, from aldosterone or gray if they're from APO SR2 simulations. And what you see here is basically clusters that are very distinct, right? They're really non-overlapping. There's They're either orange or they're gray, which indicates that aldosterone when bound to SR2 is significantly changing SR2 dynamics and is uh, causing there to be no conformational overlap with the APO. And I look at this for the rest of my um, three keto steroids and I see the same effects. These cl clusters are either orange or gray. So there, there's again, no conformational overlap. Then I, and I compare this with the estrogen, I see that there is conformational overlap because these clusters have significant populations for the most part of both, from both simulations, right? So, so the summary from this uh, clustering is that these three keto steroids seem to be significantly altering conformational dynamics in SR2 while the estrogens do not. And then the last thing that I looked at here was I went back to revisit this um, interaction between the methionine and the leucine right above the A-ring, this one that seems to be discriminating between the type of hormone in the pocket. And I, and I wanted to ask, 
does that interaction, does that carry through in the clustering? So what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at a representative structure from each of these clusters and I've colored them just by what cluster they came from. And so what you see, if you just kind of look through is that you see all pretty much most of the orange clusters are pointing up, indicating that they are pointing to make that interaction with leucine that we expect from three ketosteroids. While a lot of the gray clusters are either pointing down or just pointing somewhere else, right? So there's a clear distinction um, with that interaction and how it's carrying through and how it's affecting even this, just like the, the, cl the, the clustering um, patterns that we see. And then what's interesting is that you look at the estradiol complex and there's no such discrimination right there. The, um, again, because that methionine we know is not really, uh, doesn't play a strong, uh, a strong role, as strong of a role in the estrogen complexes as it does in the three ketosteroid complexes. So a summary, if this will click, okay. So summary of what's uh, of, of everything that I've said is it seems uh, what appears hap is happening in SR2 is that this methionine leucine interaction is enabling SR2 to distinguish between estrogens and three ketosteroid hormones. And I'm, I'm showing you that here. And then the other thing that's, that seems to be happening is that the reason that methionine isn't able to um, uh, the, the methionine isn't able to be stabilized by estrogens is because there could be frustration that results from the presence of a, the specific interaction between the methionine and an aromatized airing that the estrogens have. And then based on clustering um, and, con and enhanced sampling, it seems that the three ketosteroids are significantly altering conformational dynamics in SR2, while the estrogens do not. And the one last thing that I wanted to say is, for anyone who cares about steroid receptor signaling or even maybe nuclear receptors in general, is we know that for these kinds of receptors that the activation function two surface is, is an important a part of how they are regulated because this is where co-regulators bind. And so what's interesting is that just looking at this picture hopefully gives even, kind of gives you a clear uh, representation of how this, how the, the ability of ligands to modulate this interaction between the methionine and the leucine can directly affect the dynamics at the activation function to surface. And that, and that, can give, that gives you an idea of how um, this could modulate just transcriptional activity for, um, for this receptor. All right, so thank you all for listening. Um, I And thanks again to the organizers for inviting me. I just wanted to quickly acknowledge uh, my co-authors on this paper, are David uh, and Stephen, and um, of course, Eric and the rest of the Ortland Lab are uh, shown here in this picture. Uh, this is actually the last picture that I took with the lab in November because now I have moved on and I'm at the Okafora Lab at Penn State now. and. Um, and this work is mostly funded by my Burroughs Welcome Fund that, um, award that Eric mentioned. So thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. If there are. Thank you, Denise. Excellent talk. So I'm going to moderate your questions, and I'll, I guess we'll go in order. Um, Volker has, I think, the first question. Yeah, great, uh, great talk. I was just wondering whether this ligand, this um, pair of residues that you've identified is conserved throughout evolution. If you'll now look into the diversification of receptors do you see that mutated or conserved that would correspond with having a contact or no contact? Uh, excellent question. So the answer is the, the, the pair of, re of residues are not conserved, but the interaction between that pair of residues is conserved. So there is actually a really nice, re really nice studies in a modern glucocorticoid receptor and mineralocorticoid receptors that show how the residues are paired to so that yeah, so where where you know like they're 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 paired so that they are always able to form that contact and mutating them has effects that will affect the, that will kill the receptor or you know mess with its activity. So the interaction is conserved. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Joshua. Hi. Uh, great talk. Um, I was wondering, using this interesting molecular dynamics approach, um, have you you alluded to it maybe with the coactivator site? But I'm wondering if anybody's done any further work looking at DNA binding as a way for regulating the allosteric, um, whether it's the ligand interaction or the conformational flexibility of the receptor. So the DNA itself could yeah. be something that is sort of biasing whether or not ligand occupancy is continuing, coactivators are binding, and this might be an approach to, to check this out. 
I, I completely agree. And I think that would be something that's really cool to do. Um, the, the challenge would be being able to model a full length a receptor that has both the, D, the DNA binding domain. So everything that I've done here has been focused on the ligand binding domain. I might not have said that, but, but um, yeah, the challenge would be getting a model of a, of a full or at least both of those domains. Um, yeah. And if I remember, there's sort of a neck that bridges the two domains. Yeah, and there is, there's yeah, some okay. argument over whether the DNA binding might actually affect this ligand pocket or not. Right. So like you said, it might be very difficult, but this might be the one way to get at it. But I, uh, really, really interesting thank talk. Thank you. I, I completely agree. And that's hopefully that's where things are going. <laughs> very cool. All right, uh, Tim? Hi, from London. Uh, fascinating work, uh, what you can do. Uh, the first question I had was, I, I was once told that, I, I heard that pi electrons were not modeled by some molecular dynamics platforms. Is that, have I got that wrong? I was, I was told that too. And, um, and, and, and they're not actually, I'm sorry, pi electrons are not, I guess they're not explicitly modeled by molecular dynamics, but it, it seems that it seems that um, I, I guess just I guess with the charges that are that you know like just the partial charges on in a pi in an aromatic ring somehow they're able to be so they're not modeled as pi electrons but I guess they're modeled reasonably enough that that the um, the program can pick them up. Wow, that's interesting. That's fascinating. And my other question, because I work uh, vaguely in the field of lipid transfer proteins, phospholipid and sterol. So uh, one of the issues that has always been said is that you couldn't work out what the ligand of a phospholipid transfer protein is, except by experiment. And, but you have found basically sort of differences between you've got all these different 23 things, maybe, you know, and, and maybe you could say, actually, some of them, you know, you could use the or could you basically the question is, could you use lessons from those 23? to then apply it to another set of another, say, 53 on another protein with another set of ligands and say, actually, yes, you could say this one looks like the ligand and the other ones aren't. So I do, I do have a hypothesis that it's possible to do this. Um, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't done it yet, but I would, it's something that I would like to try. It's something that I, that I hope that that is possible because of what I've learned from doing this. Are you going to do it in your new lab? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I can do anything. I'll email you. I'll email you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank very you. Good. Great. Uh, John? Denise, very cool talk. Um, so I have a question. Uh, so that, that leucine uh, methionine pair that you, you picked out, uh, yeah. and so you have that, the, the different set of clusters of conformations that you're finding, uh, essentially if that pair is forming or not forming. When you look at what's happening on the others, on the leucine side of things, can yeah. you... Can you come up with a molecular mechanism on how that conformational change is propagating? So when you say um, propagating, what do you mean? Like, do you mean so, so uh, if this is like one of the major uh, differences in between kind of the ligand bound state uh, or either between the two ligands, when you have the, the non uh, aromatic ring that right. that interaction is being formed. Yep. And then there's these two separate, and so looking at this analysis, you get very different clusters of conformations, depending on yep. if that uh, ligand is present or not. Um, and so if you look at specifically what's happening with that, is that leucine kind of changing its conformation? And then you can see a propagation down the helix? I mean, it's kind of a, a, a tricky question. So when you look at that RMSD analysis, can you really see how that specific interaction is actually leading to this, this propagation? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, your question makes perfect sense. Um, I did not look at this during my when, from the simulations, so I can't. I, I I like to imagine it, it is possible to 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 ask what the leucine is doing and ask just kind of what are downstream effects, right? Like what's happening even to everything else that's in the activation function surface. Um, I did not do that here, so I I think it's possible, but I don't know for sure. Okay, cool. It'll be something fun to try in the future. Yeah, for sure. Okay, there's one more question. I'm just going to read. So, uh, how how did you classify conformations, and how did you choose the number of classes? Um, I so I everything is done by an an, um, an automated clustering algorithm. I just have to pick, I guess, my RMSD cutoffs, and so I I 
I had to play, I, and I, the, the, I guess the, the key thing is to use the same cutoff for all of the complexes. And so you see, for example, on this slide that the DHT, um, the DHT complex seems to be a little bit more um, conformationally diverse than the other complexes. But um, I, I just picked a, a, an, R, an RMSD um, that gave me a reasonable number of clusters that I could look at each one. So pick something too small, then you get, you know, 20 something clusters or yeah, I just, I picked a, a good number. Great, thank you, Denise. Thank you. All right, uh, all kind of virtual, that was great. Thank you, Denise. Um, and mm -hmm. I'll introduce uh, Volker, who will introduce our next speaker. Um, hello, welcome everybody. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Linda Salvati. Uh, Linda is um, a former PhD student. Uh, unfortunately, she's former because she's actually really left the lab just a couple of months back. Um, she was originally uh, from Berlin and um, received training in um, biology, in fact, in molecular neurobiology at Humboldt University, and then joined us a couple of years back to work on a protein. Um, originally, we thought we should work on it in neurons, but then it turned out um, on a detour that it was much more important in another cell type that um, she's going to introduce you to in just a few moments. So um, it's my pleasure um, to introduce Linda, and uh, I would like to let you know that I think she still hasn't made up her mind what to do in the future. So if you have um, great job offers for her, she might be interested in, in that as well. So um, without much further ado, I'll hand over to Linda. Yeah, thank you, Volker, and uh, good evening also from my side to everyone. So as has just been mentioned, um, in this project or in this work that I will present today, uh, we were dealing with a pretty uh, important and global mechanism in the mammalian nervous system that is called myelination. And we were investigating a, a regulatory mechanism underlying the myelin homeostasis in which um, the lipid turnover or the turnover of distinct lipids actually uh, takes a central role. And I will come back to that pretty long title of our study later on and first introduce a bit more the distinct lipids that uh, we were um, focusing on in our work. And these are a distinct kind of phospholipids, so-called phosphatidylinositol phosphates, of course, with their characteristic fatty acid uh, uh, residues. And as a polar hat group, um, they contain a phosphorylated inositol ring. This can be additionally phosphorylated at uh, the positions three, four, or five, and thereby can form up to seven different species. And these species are of a very low abundance and reside in the cytoplasmic leaflet of uh, intracellular membranes. So as you can see here, exemplified for um, the PI3 phosphates, for different PI3 phosphates, um, these species all have some kind of specific localization within the intracellular membrane system and uh, serve as important factors for the recruitment of regulatory proteins, um, but also uh, for distinct signaling processes. Now, um, of course, they are as well very tightly regulated by a cohort of different kinases uh, and phosphatases. And uh, the phosphatases that we were actually interested here in our study um, are MTMs, so PI3 phosphatases, here and here. So these MTMs or myotubularine related, uh, sorry, one second, myotubularine related proteins as a family um, that has uh, two special features. The first feature is that half of this small family or half of the members of the small family um, uh, is actually an active, which means, um, yeah, and on the other end, the active MTMRs, such as MTMR2, specifically dephosphorylate PI3P or PI3P5P2 at the three position, whereas the remaining members be a mutation in their phosphatase domain that renders them inactive. So this is, for example, the case for MTMR5 and MTMR13. Um, the second feature that uh, uh, is very special about this family is that uh, you can see some complex formation between distinct active and inactive um, MTMR family members. This is, for example, the case for MTMR2, an active member with R5 and R13, two uh, close homologues and inactive phosphatases. 
and this kind of complex formation is presumed to um, modulate the specificity, the activity, and also the localization of the active complex partner. Now, we were mostly interested in exactly these three MTMRs, as they are all linked to myelin homeostasis, as a mutation in either of the three genes results in an inherited so-called demyelinating neuropathy. So before I go more into detail regarding the disease, I will would like to first remind you about um, the structure and also the function of myelin. So um, myelin or the myelin sheath um, is actually an electronically pretty dense uh, um, structure that surrounds the axon. It consists of uh, several layers of elipids, of membranes, that are tightened together by uh, distinct so-called myelin residing proteins, and thereby forming an electronical insulation uh, for the axon um, from its environment. And this fact, plus uh, the fact that these myelin sheets are um, segmentally, uh, segmentally orientated along the axon, allows for the so-called saltatory conduction, which is jumping like very fast action potential propagation in contrast to these non-myelinated um, axons. Now, mm -hmm. uh, what happens if um, the expression of one of the before mentioned MTMRs is lost or improper, um, or what results from that is the neuropathy that is called charcot marie -Tooth disease type 4B or CMT4B, which is characterized by focal hypermyelination. That um, means some kind of myelin deformation that is depicted here. So uh, the CMT4B axon, as you can appreciate, is especially pretty much restricted in contrast to the control axon uh, due to the occurrence of these redundant myelin loops called myelin outfoldings. And the appearance of more and more of these features within the nerves lead to a reduced nerve conduction and uh, finally to uh, pretty severe motoric disabilities that already start uh, in the early childhood of CMT4B patients. And as this is a progressive disease, it can even lead in elder patients to a respiratory failure. So it's a pretty severe uh, disease resulting from the loss of expression of either of these MTMRs. However, it is not, uh, the reason for that is not really clear. So vice versa, how MTMR2, R5 or R13 are actually implicated in the regulation of myelin homeostasis is not known so far. And uh, we uh, actually stumbled into these, uh, let's say, open questions um, by serendipity while we were investigating, sorry, while we were investigating the uh, interactome of a small GDPase called RAP35. So uh, we did so by uh, performing a bio, -ID, a bio ID screen a couple of years ago, that is an established uh, um, screen for interactors. Um, so in this, your protein of interest is fused to a mutant biotin ligase. Um, this whole construct is expressed in a cell system and upon biotin supplementation, this promiscuitive BIA starts to biotinylate everything that is in its close uh, proximity. So among the fraction of RAP35 associated proteins, so the biotinylated proteins, we found uh, two MTMRs highly enriched, MTMR5 and MTMR13, so the two close homologous uh, um, inactive phosphatases, MTMR phosphatases, that are also associated with the myelin disease. So that's uh, what, of course, aroused our interest, and we started to further characterize um, the interaction between these protein or this potential interaction. Um, and we did so by first uh, um, performing an in vitro pull-down assay, in which we um, of course, uh, respect its effects that small GDPases have two different kinds of states. So an inactive state when GDP is bound and they are usually more cytoplasmic and an active one when GDP is bound and they are more active and membrane bound. So um, in this uh, in vitro pull down assay, we uh, used a recombinant RAP35, GST-tagged and supplemented 
uh, it with either DTP for activation or GDP for inactivation. And um, indeed, what we could, found, uh, could find was a very specific uh, association of MTMR5 and MTMR13 with the active origin of RAP35. And this was also specific to the two MTMRs. Again, as in the bio ID, we didn't see any association with uh, other tested MTMR family members. In addition, uh, we performed uh, a localization study by co-expressing or over-expressing um, MTMR13 on the one hand and a constitutively active mutant of RAP35 on the other one. On the other hand, that uh, should mimic the GTP bound version, the active version of RAP35. So um, over-expressing or co-expressing MTMR13 under control conditions with a GFP construct, uh, construct leads to a cytoplasmic, pretty diffuse signal. However, upon co-expression with uh, the constitutively active form of RAP35, MTMR13 is, uh, was now observed to partially enrich on LAMP1 positive cis green uh, compartments that represent late endosomal lysosomal membranes. So from that, we concluded that uh, MTMR13 and MTMR5 rather associate with the active form of RAP35, presumably by that are, uh, or get recruited actually by that to distinct uh, membrane compartments. Now again, these two are in active phosphatases and as is so far known, the main function is actually the complex, fun uh, complex formation with the one active phosphatase MTMR2. So we wondered if this complex formation would still be possible if RAP35 uh, interacts with um, the uh, inactive phosphatases. And uh, in order to find that out, we performed again this uh, GSD pull-down assay, but now with lysates from hexals that co-express MTMR2 and MTMR13. And indeed, in that case, we could detect now uh, clearly MTMR2 um, enriched with uh, the active um, in the active fraction uh, or in the fraction of uh, active RAP35. So um, letting presume that RAP35 can indeed bind and maybe also regulate the whole MTMR, the whole active MTMR complex out of R2 and R13 or R2 and R5. Um, so this also implicates that RAP35 indirectly or directly interacts with all three of these myelin and myelin disease associated uh, proteins. Uh, so, of course, vice versa, we were interested if RAP35 might be also some kind of implicated in the regulation of uh, PNS myelin homeostasis. And uh, therefore, we teamed up with uh, Alessandra Bolino and uh, her lab from Milan, who are myelin experts, um, in order to investigate a strong cell specific knockout mouse uh, um, for RAP35. So Schwann cells are actually the cells that are producing um, myelin in the PNS. And in order to investigate uh, PNS myelination, this uh, sciatic nerve, our thickest and longest nerve, is a usual model uh, uh, system um, in which you just uh, usually investigate cross sections in order to see something like that here from control animals. Um, so very nicely, the nerve fibers, the axons in white and surrounded by the dark myelin um, uh, sheets. Now, in contrast to that, as you can easily appreciate here, uh, the cross sections of RAP35 knockout animals um, revealed a striking phenotype, revealed uh, a high proportion of abnormally myelinated fibers that showed uh, um, features of focal hypermyelination such as tomacular or myelin outfoldings. So resembling a bit on the CMT4B um, mouse model nerves. But not only onto them, but also focal or features of focal hypermyelination uh, are also observed, interestingly, in mouse models um, that have an mTOR, that have mTOR1 hyperactivity. So mTOR1 is an important interface in all of our cells that uh, adapts the anabolism or catabolism, so that adapts the cellular response to the extra uh, environmental um, conditions, so the availability of nutrients, energy, or oxygen. These extracellular cues are translated down to mTOR1 via different signaling uh, pathways, such as PS3K, AKT, 
and uh, for example under favorable conditions thereby mTOP1 gets activated and its uh, core kinase mTOR starts to phosphorylate downstream targets that promote the cellular anabolism. And among uh, um, the different cellular components that are upregulated by that, um, especially the lipids and especially fatty acids um, are very crucial for Schwann cells as these cells uh, have to produce a vast amount of lipids um, in order to form up the myelin. So it is estimated uh, of around, uh, that Schwann cells produce around 2,000 times more membrane than, um, let's say, normal epithelial cell. And in addition, also distinct myelin proteins, uh, or the synthesis of distinct myelin proteins is also promoted by mTOR1 indirectly. Now, um, these, uh, uh, or this is at least one of the reasons, or that is so far assumed why um, these mouse mutants here, in which uh, um, P10 or TSC1, so suppressors of mTOR1 activity, um, are ablated in Schwann cells, lead to these, uh, uh, these redundant myelin formation, so additional myelin formation. Again, features that resemble uh, very much the ones that are also seen upon RAP35 not out in Schwann cells. And therefore, uh, we wondered if RAP35 depletion might have some impact uh, on mTOP1 activity. Um, so in order to figure that out, we checked the phosphorylation status of the S6 kinase, a target of mTOP1, and indeed uh, could find elevated levels of phosphor S6K and therefore um, elevated activity of mTOP1 in RAP35 knockout cells. In contrast, AKT, so an upstream activator of mTOC1 in this PS3 kinase AKT pathway, was not elevated. From what we concluded that uh, RAP35 has some influence, has some impact on mTOC1 activity that is independent of this upstream pathway. Now, of course, uh, we were also interested if the interactor of RAP35, of the novel interactor that we have found, MTMR2, might uh, also influence mTOC1 activity. And indeed it does. So uh, knockdown, um, or the depletion of MTMR2 by a knockdown uh, actually results in a similar mTOP1 um, active hyperactivation as the depletion of RAP35 does. And moreover, um, the re-expression of MTMR2 rescues mTOP1 hyperactivity not only in MTMR2 depleted cells, but also in RAP35 depleted cells. So in agreement with our um, interaction studies, uh, we, we uh, concluded that MTMR2 is acting downstream of RAP35 as some kind of executive authority that finally represses mTOP1 somehow. We didn't know at that point how, but of course, uh, the closest idea um, is uh, uh, to keep the, um, the phosphatase activity of MTMR2 in mind. And as I have told you in the beginning, uh, MTMR2 is able to dephosphorylate PI3, 5P2, for example, producing PI5 P. So we hypothesized that upon loss of RAP35, MTMR2 or the whole active MTMR complex might be um, misfunctional, uh, for example, due to mislocalization. And this could lead to an accumulation of PI3, 5P2, um, which might be causal for the mTOP1 activity. So um, yes, 35 p 2 is actually produced only in one production chain, and that is the phosphorylation of PI3P via PIC5. So uh, it is fairly easy to, um, or fairly reliable by uh, interfering with the PIC5 activity using a specific inhibitor, as such as uh, a pilimod, to interfere or to downregulate reliably the PI35P2 levels. And that's actually what we did now in order to see um, if we could also interfere with the accumulation, with the presumed accumulation of this lipid, and uh, in order to see uh, which kind of influence that would have on the mTOP1 activity in our cells. So we used uh, transfer monocultures here, again, could detect um, mTOP1 hyperactivity in the RAP35 knockout cells and 
this was actually rescued upon chronicle application using a pili mod, um, mean, uh, yeah, meaning that uh, uh, indeed PI35P2 seems to be causal for M21 activity. Now there's also a more direct way to interfere with mTOR1 activity, and that is the uh, specific inhibition of mTOR1 via rapamycin. And one of the big advantages of rapamycin is also that it's already established for an in vivo application. So the RAP35 knockout mice were administered for two months uh, with rapamycin and um, in order to see if mTOR1 it could be indeed uh, the cause factor for uh, focal hypermyelination. And uh, what we could find afterwards was um, a partial amelioration of focal hypermyelination features. This was a bit less for the features that uh, have an pathological onset um, prior to the treatment or prior, let's say, to uh, the, the point where, an, uh, to, the, to the age of the animals, where an uncritical treatment of uh, the knockout animals was possible. However, the amelioration uh, shows that um, definitely mTOR1, at least partially, um, is causal for the focal hypermyelination in RAP35 knockout mice. And this finally leads me back to uh, the long title of our study and therefore to the summary. Um, so what we think what happens in physiolog under physiological conditions is that RAP35 recruits um, active MDMR phosphatase complexes, presumably to late endosomal lysosomal membranes, where it um, degrades PI35P2 and thereby limits mTOR1 activity, as well as the growth of myelin. Uh, upon loss of RAP35, the um, MTMR complexes are uh, mislocalized, which leads to an accumulation of PS35P2, a hyperactivation of mTOR1, and thereby unlimited growth of uh, uh, myelin, which somehow ends up in these weird features that are known as focal hypermyelination. And when I say somehow ends up, um, this is actually because um, this belongs to some of my uh, still open questions, or this is actually a still open question in the field and hotly debated by the uh, myelin community, how this, fo this focal hypermyelination in the end arise from mTOR1 um, activity. So one of the hypotheses um, is, for example, that an asymmetry between uh, the incorporation of lipids into new myelin and the incorporation of just distinct myelin proteins, because just some of them, or the synthesis of just some of them is promoted by mTOR1, um, that this asymmetry could lead to this kind of deformations. Um, in uh, myelin sheets. Um, secondly, what we haven't tackled in uh, our study so far is uh, how RAP35 itself is regulated. Uh, we know that small GDPases are usually tightly regulated. They have uh, GAFs, so activation and recruitment factors, and also GAFs, inactivation factors. And uh, we don't know yet. We have some, some hot candidates, but we don't know yet uh, which of them is really responsible for the recruitment, for example, of RAP35 to isolate endosomal lysosomal membranes. And um, last but not least, of course, uh, what uh, conclusions can be drawn back from our data to the CMT4B research? So, for example, can, could inhibition of mTOR1 or PEG5 um, be a viable option for the treatment of CMT4B patients? But of course, this uh, has to be, uh, yeah, has to be uh, the focus of ongoing research. And I would like to end uh, with some, or at least many, acknowledgements. Um, so I would like to thank all the people, uh, of course, that have uh, supported and or promoted this project, and of course the ones that have especially participated in the work. Uh, so first of all, of course, my PhD supervisor, Volker Hauke, um, but also all my former colleagues uh, in his lab, um, especially Maria Mülbau and Sabine Hahn for the technical support, but also the mass spectrometry facility from our institute. And of course, uh, special thanks to our collaborators who uh, 
just made uh, the publication or the finish of the completion of this work possible. Um, first of all, Alessandra Bolino and her team, especially Federica Grandi, um, who have performed the work with uh, RAP35 knockout mice, as a Schwann cell specific uh, in vivo analysis. Uh, then Arno Echar and his team, as well as Stephen Shaw and Gennaro Patino Lopez. Um, who have generated uh, the flux RAP35 mice, and uh, finally also Cesare Montecucco and Samuel Negro for their kind um, method training. And uh, yes, last but not least, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And yeah, your questions, don't hesitate. Sorry? Yeah, thank you very much, um, Linda. Um, I think I'll just go through the chat. There is already a few um, questions. John has the first one. I guess that's great talk. Um, uh, quick question on kind of one of your open questions. Which is the GEF that regulates RAB35? Uh, in general or in our process? Uh, either. I mean, there are different GEFs actually. They are quite some, uh, usually the DENDs, DENDY1A, DENDY1B, DENDY1C, and also folliculin. So these four are the main gaps that regulate RAP35 in different kind of processes. But as I said, uh, we haven't really tackled um, the upstream regulation of RAP35 here uh, in our work yet. So we don't know which one, um, which gap is really acting here. But actually folliculin, for example, is known to somehow indirectly uh, do also some kind of mTOR1 uh, um, regulation and uh, also sometimes reside on lysosomal membranes. So this could be, for example, Okay, perfect. Um, Thank you. Yeah, um, second question is by uh, Alejandro Alvarez uh, Prato. Um, I can read his question or he can unmute himself. He says, very exciting work since RAD35 has been reported to be an important regulator of actin dynamics. And because actin plays a role in myelination, any chance that actin dysregulation also contributes to the phenotype? I don't know if he wants to add to that. Hi, yeah. Well, thank you for uh, reading that question. So yeah, exactly. That, that was my, my, my question. If you uh, have any feeling about actin also contributing to the phenotype? So um, I would definitely not exclude it due to also the, um, the uh, fact that actin dynamics are also important for myelination itself. We didn't really went into that here uh, with our work, but uh, I guess it's definitely uh, worth it. That's what I can say. Um, so yes, there is a chance that also actin deregulation is actually participating in this uh, pretty huge phenotype in the RAP35 knockout mice, um, as some other processes might also be. All right. Thank you. Very nice work. Yeah. Um, Michael Arola? Uh, yeah, beautiful talk, Linda. I, I just had a question about the inactive uh, MTMR5. How are they inactivated? Is there is it just a key catalytic residue that's mutated? And exactly. Is yeah, there any, is there any possibility that they would bind PI three five P still, just not dephosphorylated? Um, you mean that they bind lipids in general without any dephosphorylation, right? That's yeah. what you mean. Yes. So it's not really clear. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. No, I can actually not really answer that. I know that yeah, the catalytically residues are, are mutated, so you don't get any catalytical activity, but if there is still binding, I mean, a recognition, you mean in that case, right? Because the binding is... Yeah, I'm just wondering, I guess, John, that, I mean, when you originally showed your work at, without the RAB um, 35, I was wondering mm -hmm. if that protein would just recruit it to the membranes where PI35P was, um, if it was somehow localizing it to the to the substrate or the active. Without, without RAP35. 
Well, that's what I was originally thinking. And then you showed obviously that RAP35 was important, but I'm still wondering if it, if it helps yeah. direct the, so, the phosphatase. So actually, actually that uh, was always presumed because these MTMRs do have some other um, uh, lipid binding domains. For example, um, the MTMR5 and MTMR13 both have, have a pH domain. But for MTMR5, it has been already shown that membrane association uh, or for the membrane association, it is dispensable. Then all of the MTMRs actually have a gram pH domain. It is not really clear what it binds. It was also suggested, I think, by one paper uh, or in the literature earlier that it, this could be the PS35P2 binding domain. But in the end, it could never be really shown. So, and actually all of the MTMRs have a gram pH. Presumably it doesn't bind PS3P, but we know that there are different preferences of the different MTMRs to uh, either catalyze more or dephosphorylate rather PS3P or PS3P. Okay. The question okay. of this gram, if this gram pH domain is really the best candidate for it, but yeah. Okay, thank you. A question from Amy Kiger. Uh, maybe Amy wants to unmute herself. Uh, yeah, great talk. Thank you. Um, does this RAB35 pathway through MTMR13 and MTMR2, um, do you have evidence of influencing mTOR1 activity in other cell types? So um, we definitely see a regulation of mTOR1 by RAB35 also in other cell types. So we did uh, uh, different experiments in like hack cell lines. We also did it in primary astrocytes. Um, so we do see it in other cells. The one thing that we think that seems rather Schwann cell specific is actually the PI35P2 as the activation uh, uh, signal for mTOR1. Because um, also recent literature that has already suggested that uh, PS35P2 might be uh, um, an activation signal for mTOR1, but always rather uh, focus on PI3P. So, um, which doesn't seem to be the case in the Schwann cells. So this is something very Schwann cell specific. And finally, due to the um, great phenotype that, uh, or due to this neuropathic phenotype that um, is occurring upon loss of MTMR2, MTMR13, MTMR5, namely only in Schwann cells and not in other cells. Um, the question is, I mean, I don't think the question is if RAP35 can associate with these MTMRs in other cells, but um, rather if these MTMRs are rather dispensable or compensatable, uh, redundant in other cells. You know what I mean? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, and there's a question from Pietro about OCRL. I don't know, Pietro, you want to yeah. say something? I wonder whether since uh, OCRL is a major effector of RAP35, is there is mm -hmm. it be an effect also of OCRL by the phosphorylated the phi position of PI35P2? So whether RAP35 act by acting on two phosphatases, by, by activating two phosphatases. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not aware of literature where PS35P2 uh, was seen as a potential substrate for OCRL. Not a good substrate, but it can be affected a little bit. Yeah, and yeah. There are previous studies that uh, genetic study that is linked as PF, which is M M uh, MTMR13, OCRL, and RAF35. I can send it to you later. Yeah. Yeah, if I, if I may comment, uh, Pietro, the phenotype, uh, it's quite interesting, the phenotype of RAP35 is in fact stronger than the one of either MTMR2 or 5 and 13. So there is probably additional contributions, could be anything, of course, right? Mm -hmm. May not necessarily have to be OCRL, it could also be other phosphatases yeah, yeah. or actin, as we discussed, but it's stronger. Anyway, very nice, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tamas? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating story. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering whether maybe RAP35 could be uh, also regulated by phosphoinositides. That relates to Pietro's question. Is it possible that you have ki almost kind of a feedback loop where, uh, where some of the PI lipids would uh, also determine the GTP loading status of RAP35? Um, 
it is uh, it is not uh, unprobable due to the fact that uh, some of the gaps of RAP35 are indeed um, binder, lipid binders, so PIP binders. Um, so it could be that in the beginning of the chain, so prior to the gaps, there might be some kind of lipid that regulates RAP35, but indirectly in that case, I, I would assume as far as we know, because um, the main uh, regulatory upstream regulator are always gaps as far as we know yeah but it could be it could be uh, yeah okay uh, and then there is a question on lysosomes from Jim. oh hi. very nice talk um, you mentioned that RAP35 recruits MTMR13 to lysosome. So I was just wondering, um, do you know RAP35 can affect lysosome function or location or anything else? So um, we definitely did not check the lysosomal function. Uh, what we checked uh, was the localization and also the uh, appearance of lysosomes. And um, at least in primary knockout cultures, uh, we actually couldn't see any great change. So no increase in the immunostaining signal or no enlargement of, uh, of the organelles. But yeah, that doesn't exclude, of course, that the function might be somehow um, modulated in the absence of RAP35. Okay, I see no further questions and I think I'll just hand it back to John. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Linda and Denise. Those are great talks. Um, just as a quick uh, reminder, um, we'll be back again next week. Um, and then you'll probably get an email from us on what our plan is uh, going on from there. Um, and yeah, hope to see you all next week. Thanks a lot, everyone.